For overall questions, Tech Talk, and if you'd like to submit your reel for us to actually critique live, uh, please see the links below, and we will definitely get to them in the order that they appear. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. Hollywood Big Shot's going to give you what you want. With great humility and uh, pleasure, uh, we have Steve Wright here, who I consider to be the, uh, I think a lot of people consider to be the godfather of VFX. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever referred to you as that, but uh, I've heard uh, that a lot. I've heard, I've heard father. I've heard uncle. You're the first godfather. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve has, uh, I first uh, got to, you know, find, you. basically a lot of people find out about Steve, maybe through a YouTube video at first, uh, when they're starting off with compositing. He's got the, one of the, I believe, the number one video on IBK Gizmo, IBK Color, which is the green screen tool. Uh, and he has a great, he, he, every, everyone loves him because he is a great guy, first off. And he is great at explaining things. And I have basically done all my training has been inspired by him because he has a layman's terms of presenting so many things that are unbelievably complicated in visual effects. You take a very, not childlike, but just very gentle approach to everything you do. And um, Steve is also well-renowned for his training at FX uh, Academy. Uh, he, besides the fact that Steve has probably the greatest history in VFX uh, uh, history, you can see this is his IMDB right here, and it's just, I mean, we're going way back here, back to 19, you know, 19, 1957, is that right? Well, no fair, no fair. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a rework of a project that was shot initially in 1957. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes. And then we got the good old classic Superman 3. Uh, well, that's the that's the video game, right? Yeah, what am I saying? Okay. No, no, wow. Superman 3, the movie. Video video game, okay. And then uh, you've, you've worked on Batman Robin. A lot of it, from what I can see, is Cinecite. Yes. And yep. there's some really gem movies I absolutely love that I can see in here. Um, 13th Warrior... Uh, mm -hmm. The Mothman Prophecies, that is a creepy film. I don't know if anybody ever seen that. Um, you like that movie? What's that? You like that movie? Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of <laughs> creepy. Um, the, uh, the Time Machine, great, great oh, yes. film. Clock Stoppers, that's a, that's a movie that no one's probably seen, but man, it's a great film. Um, very along the lines of like uh, Office Space, in a way, um, mm -hmm. if I recall. Um, yep. Man, I, I go back on that one. Barbershop 2, shot here in Chicago, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, lots of movies here. Uh, Big Mama's House, Stay, uh, see right here. Shutter Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you've worked with you worked with a ton of different VFX houses here. And is this your own uh, company, Steve Wright Digital Effects? Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, it, it's a that's my you know business entity, and underneath that is the training website FX Academy. Gotcha. But when I uh, I'm I'm routinely retained to go out to visual effects studios to do staff training, and when I do that, I'm I'm under the rubric of Steve Wright Digital Effects. Awesome. The um, Steve has an incredible site FX Academy. And there's a ton of awesome training here. A lot of people uh, get their start, and then they get their professional training as they kind of learn new tools and, and and tips and so forth. So there's a ton of training here. We highly recommend you guys check it out. Um, before I uh, let him take the take the wheel and introduce himself, which I should do right now, I just want to plug two of his books here. They're great books: Digital Compositing Your Film and Video. There you go. So this is the video. This is the uh, quote unquote, uh, you know, like Bible for VFX, basically. And right. what I love about your book is um, I, what I what always intrigued me when I read it was uh, the indexes in the back are absolutely awesome. Um, oh, just thank you. Yeah. all the great stuff that you have um, in the back there. And I'm sure you'll be able to. I don't think I've ever I, I've heard about this book, but I've never actually picked it up. But Composing Visual Effects Essentials for the Aspiring Artist. Well, so, here's the distinction here. Yes. This book is designed for people who are not compositors, but who are thinking about it. You know, gee, I'm, I'm going to college, am I going to be a 2D guy, am I going to be a 3D guy? Or producers who don't know anything about visual effects, or people who are thinking about the possibility of considering maybe going into visual effects. So the idea is to take somebody, uh, you know, from a standing start, 
and give them sort of the gestalt of compositing visual effects. The other book is designed for sitting compositors. It's a workstation book, okay? It should be sitting right next to your workstation. What is, um, you know what, before we start, um, obviously I didn't, I didn't allow you uh, your, your introduction, so um, did, you, did you just want to introduce yourself? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, well, okay. This is Steve Wright, everybody. Hi. Uh, hi, hi, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm, I'm Steve Wright. I've been in the visual effects game since, frankly, the early 80s. I, I like to say in the year 5 BC, before computers. And um, I started it off uh, at Atari. I was a game programmer at Atari for, for a while. And then I came to Hollywood, again in the gaming industry, uh, to head up the Sega Paramount project. The idea we were going to take Paramount video games, Sega arcade technology, put them together. Well... Shortly after that venture formed, that's when the bottom fell out of the video game industry. So I found myself abandoned in Hollywood, <laughs> okay, <laughs> looking for a job. And a buddy of mine uh, uh, had a job at Robert Abel and Associates, set the Wayback Machine. Uh, Robert Abel was one of the founding fathers of CGI, 3D animation. And so I got a job there and uh, was there about five or six years and learned about 3D animation, okay, then they went out of business. There's a lot of turnover in this industry, as you may know. <laughs> so from there, uh, my buddy and I formed our own little CGI company right after Robert Abel folded, and we produced, you know, the usual television commercials and uh, things like that. Now, we're now in the middle 90s here, and here was the problem, I noticed. We would, we would uh, render some CGI for the nice customer, and then render out the alpha channel, put it onto D1 tape, and then they would take it into the post house and do the compositing. And I said, no, no, we should hand them a finished shot. We should do the compositing here. So I looked around. There was nothing. This is before Adobe Photoshop. I mean, this is before uh, After Effects, okay? So the only thing I could find that would put two pictures together was the Pixar computer, the P2. It was a gray box about three foot it was a cube about three foot square and it jacked into the back plane of a SGI 4D70 so it was actually on the bus within the 4D70 and so there was a direct communication between the 4D70 and Pixar's computer and um, it was a beast of a machine uh, it, it could it could handle 4k images it had 10 bits of depth in the machine now, this is this is in the machine uh, when it was processing. It had 50% uh, underflow, so it could cope with negative numbers. Whoa, big deal. The problem was this machine was designed for medical imaging and spook science and, and satellite imagery analysis. It was not really designed for visual effects. So I bought one. It was, what, $70,000, I think it was. And uh, I got the instruction set for the box. And uh, what it was was an extension to Unix. That's how you talk to the box. So to composite a shot, I wrote like 2,000 line Unix shell scripts. Okay. <laughs> and you had to, in that machine, it, it, that was not a von Neumann architecture machine. It was what's called a Harvard architecture machine. Har a von Neumann architecture there's one chunk of memory. Your programs go in there. Your data goes in there. It's all together in one memory block. In a, uh, in a, in a um, Harvard architecture, the memory for the, for the code running the machine is in a separate memory than the data because the data is going to be your pictures, your images. But the thing was blazing fast. It had a 64-bit had a bit, bit slice processor, reduced instruction set, zing pow, zoom, very fast clocks. I could do an A-fine rotate on a 2K image in less than seven seconds. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Today, my laptop can, do, can beat that, okay? But here was the point. I was, I was now in the business of compositing, okay? The rest, of the, the rest of the company was doing 3D. But now I was in, but my problem was no books, no manuals, no teachers, no classes, nothing. It was a cold start. So I learned compositing at the atomic level. Okay, <laughs> that's the way I like to describe it. It was six months before I thought I was smarter than that machine. 
but I could do things that nobody could do. And I, so I did several television commercials, again, all compositing stuff. And then CineSight opened up in Hollywood. We, and they were just like two blocks away from, from our facility. And uh, CineSight offered 2K film scans. Whoa! For the first time in history, we had high-quality film scans. Well, overnight, I'm in the film business because my machine could handle up to four 2K images in the frame buffer. <laughs> wow. Um, the machine was so beastly that you had to manage the frame buffer yourself. I had to divide it into four chunks. I had to load an image into window one and say, now, um, add window one to window two. Put the results in window three. It was that kind of a deal. Okay. So, but the point is that um, I was able to work on 2K feature film at a very high quality for the day. So I got an Acme film recorder, and I was in the film business. Uh, did a whole bunch of uh, feature films at my own little company, and then I uh, got bought out and went to CineSight. Uh, there, I uh, worked on a whole bunch more of feature films. And then when CineSight folded, it was interesting. They folded CineSight, but they retained the uh, digital intermediate department. Hmm. Now, I had made friends with the digital intermediate department people, okay? Um, I, I found the technology interesting. I wanted to understand this is obviously the new trend in the, in the industry. Remember, we're, we're now talking the, the late 90s, right? Mm -hmm. uh, early 2000s, I guess. So I went into the DI department and, and uh, learned about the DI process, and I became their go-to guy for image processing problems, okay? So when CineSight laid off, the entire visual effects department was shut down. The DI department requested that they save one, <laughs> and that was me. So I had a job after they closed CineSight uh, working with the DI department. And then after a, a year or two of that, um, I went out on my own since 2005 now. I've been doing nothing but teaching and training. Wow. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> So, um, if you don't mind, uh, can can we just uh, go down memory lane here on your IMDb? Um, I know oh, this sure. doesn't include your video game uh, work, because it's interesting, because, I, again, I come from a game design background, working at uh, uh, what is now NetherRealm Studios, formerly Midway Games. So, uh, we do have one connection, as we talked about earlier, that we uh, both worked on Mortal Kombat together. Or, not together, but two different, <laughs> two, two different periods of time, you know. Right. Um, now, remember, my, my time was at the... Uh, um, was it Video Games 1.0 at Atari? <laughs> uh, we had two 8-bit sprites, okay? So to make a video game, we had two sticks and a rock, and that was about all you had. To, to Today, the gaming machines are 10,000 times, 10 million times more powerful. But uh, in those days, uh, it was extremely primitive and crude. People forget that the visual effects industry... And even the, the artistry of game and so forth was built, the founders and the foundation, the founders basically were scientists. You know, you think about Catmull yeah. Clark, you know, I'm Ca yeah. Ed Catmull and, uh, you know, I'm sorry. No, Lauren Catmull Carpenter, Clark. Ed Catmull. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. These guys were mathematicians and, and scientists. Okay. The, um, so as far and as your way, education that's one of the background. I love about this industry is it is artistic and technical. So it's a left brain, right brain thing. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons I like it. That's one thing I push in my students is like there is a scientific approach to this process. There is such a problem solving workaround. You have to have that. It cannot be. When you get the student, I'm sure you're aware of it, that's kind of like they, the, what I call the basket case, the one that throws their hands up in the air and goes, I don't know. Help me. Yeah. And you try to help them, but they still can't seem to grasp the idea that they might act, act actually, you know, put the think tank on and go, how do I work around this? How do I work this problem, you know? Well, the, the problem is there's more to visual effects and compositing than knowing the buttons and knobs in the software. There is a math and a science behind what we do. Now, programs like Photoshop and After Effects... They try very hard to hide the technology from the poor little mm -hmm. artist. We don't want to hurt your little head. 
to worry about things like alpha channels and any stuff like that. Whereas Nuke, which, which is what I teach, that's a real man's software thing. <laughs> uh, Nuke takes a completely different approach. Nuke says, you're a big kid, you know your science, you know your math, I'm going to put all the tools on the table, you build the composite. So it's Nuke like is a completely pre different pre-multiply, what's that when it comes to like, you know, After Effects and... Yeah. You know. Well, After Effects, again, they, they bury it inside uh, so that you don't have to worry your pretty little head about it. That's the biggest thing I try to press, and it's very boring when you're teaching it to a room of you know, new students, is color science, color management. And you, they've got to get it through their skulls. And I, I try the best to put a childish approach to it as much as I can, yeah. but, uh, it, you know, even the explanations that you give and your uh, different things, if you guys haven't um, seen some of, of, of Steve's training, uh, he has an incredible series on Linda. Um, my school that I teach at Columbia gives us access to Linda, but before then I had a subscription to Linda, and he has an incredible, I would say, foundational, must-see uh, tutorial in regards to um, understanding um, nuke in general and understanding color management from a real simplistic way. Um, there, uh, of all the nuke teachers out there, you know, again, Steve is the best well, for those of you, especially that struggle with these concepts th that are very, very scientific and technical. I would say definitely check out Effects E Academy and get some of his training because he definitely breaks it down way better than even I could ever do it uh, as far as the, the clarity and being technically correct. Because some people bash my training like, you're, it's a little bit off there. And I go, well, yeah, I know it's a little bit off, but I'm just trying to convey this to a different audience of kids that are trying to understand this <laughs> as best right. as I, I can. I call it an educational expedient. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just a question: Your general education, um, if you don't mind me asking, where did you uh, did you have any general education before this, or like as far as college, or? Well, yeah, I went to San Jose State. I was a physics major and a math minor, right. and uh, found out eventually that you know with a, with a physics degree and, and a buck and a half, you could buy a cup of coffee. You had to have a PhD yeah. to even get into that. Okay, so I said, well, hell, I'll just go to Hollywood and make movies. <laughs> 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 See, I'm dealing with that now where it's like um, master's degree, master's degree. Uh, more than ever, there used to be a time where if you did work in the games or VFX industry, you could come go to work at a college. Now so much pressure is even put upon me, and I'm even contemplating. I've been offered to teach uh, full-time at a major university, one of the top ten universities, um, for in the realm of uh, it's more computer science visual effects uh, mm -hmm. but they were like you know the entire faculty said that's great yeah we'll take them uh, except uh, where's his masters so I'm actually contemplating getting my masters um, right. um, at that specific school which they told me they'd give me a free ride uh, maybe next year so I don't know yet I'll see we'll see where things are at but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just like the whole master's doctrines thing kind of drives me nuts sometimes, you know. Well, it, it's the educational industry trying to, you know, keep it purified. It's like a guild. <laughs> we want to keep the riffraff out, okay? Yeah, that's uh, true. They, they are getting a little more flexible, you know. They're, they're beginning to realize that an awful lot of us industry folk have an awful lot of knowledge that even their master's people don't have. It's called production experience okay <laughs> hey gosh what a thought right i think <laughs> riffraff riffraff uh is something that can be that from what i have seen uh permeates into the uh what i call the dinosaur uh, faculty that mm -hmm. get themselves into these tenured positions and mm -hmm. then you're like for instance i won't say which college but there was a college i taught at and they're like we need Optical comp compositing. These students have to learn optical compositing with an optical printer. An optical printer. An now, optical printer? Yes, they have a full optical printer at this school. In, an Iron Maiden? Yeah. And <laughs> the teacher, I would sit in these meetings because we build these curriculums, and the teacher there, um, you know, he's a nice guy, but he's just like, uh, I, they must take my class. And as much as I, it, and you can kind of get these teachers, and he's, let's just face it, I mean, as we get older, we just we just don't want to learn new things. I don't know, I love learning new things, but I just find yeah. that there comes a point where 
you're exhausted, you want to go home, you got your tenured, you know, you get, you get lazy. Let's just say, <laughs> you know. Well, uh, interesting story on that. I went, when I was at CineSite, uh, Purdue University came by and they wanted to talk about some technology and some projects and, you know, to help Purdue University teach their uh, visual effects stuff. And I asked the professor, well, th you, this is great. What, what's your background in, in visual effects? Uh, he worked in the Navy in graphic arts. Okay. But again, to be fair, this was back in the late 90s. Okay. And, and remember, when I started, there were no classes, no teachers, no books, nothing. Okay. So, and, and the path that I came through is not available anymore. Okay. <laughs> Steve, what if I were to tell you that that very college that I'm talking about is Purdue University? <laughs> oh, please go help them. <laughs> uh, <That's sweet. laughs> yeah, I, I figured I'd just throw it out. No, no, they're, they're, they, um, they have actually since then have done a revision. They're a whole new, whole new uh, uh, bunch of uh, group of folks there. And their mm -hmm. graduates are all working over at the Mill and Frame store and so forth. And there some, you go. Some of them follow my yeah, YouTube the, channel. They, they, uh, the colleges have started to get it that uh, we need people not only that have degrees but have production experience, been working in the industry. They understand the reality of a studio, deadlines, directors. Ah. So they, um, they're starting to pick that up. But, you know, earlier you mentioned foundational knowledge. That's one of the problems in the visual effects industry. People take classes courses, go to institute, and they learn how to run Adobe After Effects, but they don't learn the foundational knowledge, okay, camera effects, lens effects, scene composition, types of camera moves, motion blur, you know, all of the basics. Uh, in fact, about, was about six months ago, uh, um, Framestore brought me in to teach, are you sitting down, <laughs> to teach pre-multiply, pre unpre-multiply, linear light space, color theory, and, of course, advanced keying and spill suppression concepts. For two days, the entire staff of Framestore, 120 artists, and I sat there and went through these foundational topics. Wow. But good for Framestore. You know, they, they knew that, that uh, some of their folks had missed this stuff. I, I host the, uh, or I used to host until uh, the, the buyout of the Foundry took over, um, the uh, Foundry user group meetup in Chicago, and we hosted it at Framestore. Um, we, uh, last time we did it was at Framestore, but I think since the, since the Foundry got bought out by their new conglomerate or whatever, they've kind of just, they're still very cool. They've, they've uh, helped promote my website and so forth at their, their meetups, but it just seems like they've sort of like, we're taking the wheel. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so they, forth. they have a, a venture capital group running the company. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know what to say. We're seeing a lot of this now, and uh, throughout the entire industry, the buyout of the mom and popper. You know, I mean, yeah. where the golden parachutes are are, are triggered. Uh, the right. people that run these companies. Not saying that this is this is a uh, uh, specifically the foundry, but I'm talking about other other places. i I still find the foundry i have a great relationship with the foundry they're awesome folks um i have a lot of friends that work there at the foundry mm -hmm. um but I, i'm seeing a lot of these other companies other vfx houses i'm seeing a lot of really honest compositors they're not trying to create you know gossip gossip or like i don't like this place it, they're, they're, they actually get hurt by these buyouts and then these layoffs you know what i mean um, yeah, uh, well, what happens is a company starts because you've got an inspired leader with a great idea and he pulls together a team and they make the product and it's a big success. Well, once it gets past a certain critical threshold, then here come the investors, okay? Mm. <laughs> hey, we can, we can take you big time. Uh, we can, uh, you know, turn you into a real professional. But the, the problem is that changes the corporate culture. And now there are considerations, instead of being necessarily customer-based, like the original, uh, original venture was, it now becomes more of a profit-based because you have financial investors. So it changes the corporate culture. And the problem is that the people that, that uh, worked in the original culture and the customers and, like you, guys that worked with the business, the culture changes and those people fall away. Mm. I always I keep bringing up, um, and this happens in education too, where 
uh, you you get a point where, and I always bring up the Gordon Gecko line from Wall Street, which is management has no stake in the company. There comes a point where the management is just there, and this happens in education and VFX houses when these big companies take over, is you've got a series of people that don't have a, they 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 don't have a stake in the company because it's not their money, and because right. of that, everyone's basically trying to defend their own jobs, and it just becomes this big rat race, and never really about. Um, you know, for instance, I, I, I was, I, different schools I teach at, sometimes I'll have a big hoorah-rah meeting where it's like, we're going to make this school the next, and I'm like, but I don't care if this <laughs> school <laughs> becomes the next Nomen or the next, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I, I mean, whose pocketbook are you filling when you get to the Shangri-La moment, you know, where you, you know what I mean? Uh, uh-huh. it, it's not benefiting the people here. The, it's not uh, the, the 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 people that are working here are not happy, or treat are being treated a certain way. So, the only way a business, in my opinion, uh, the the long term success of it to grow is to have some so, again just the way you treat your employees. And again, yeah, business is business. There'll be layoffs. There'll be this, and that's just you know you know man up, woman up, whatever you want to say, and just business deal with it. Yeah. But at the same time, having somebody in there that has a stake in the company, you know, that right. actually owns the company, I think plays a part. Yep. You know what I mean? I don't know. Well, like like I was saying, they, they become, uh, you know, profit-focused instead of customer-focused. Uh, exactly. The mission, instead of the mission being creating great visual effects shots, the mission becomes have a great quarterly report, you know. So that changes the priorities and... Uh, create some mischief <laughs> in, our, in our in our industry but uh, speaking of training uh, <laughs> yeah one of, one of the things one of the interesting things on my website uh, mm-hmm. I, I've innovated something that I, I think is a real important new concept and that is um, a thing that I call shot kits as I'm, I'm talking to students and you know everybody's trying you got two groups you got people who are trying to break into the industry and people that are in the industry that are trying to move up. Those are two different groups. But the, the problem becomes, even if you work in a studio, you cannot build a demo reel. They won't let you have the materials for your shots. So I've heard this over and over again. So what I did was I put together shot kits. And shot kits are all of the uh, elements, all the layers at feature film resolution, feature film quality stuff. Okay, These are red shots, these are scan, film scans. I, I think the lousiest quality element I have is in there is a Sony 9, F950. Okay, But all of this is feature film and broadcast quality stuff. And these are shots that you purchase the elements and then you put it together and put it on your demo reel. Okay? So at last, people can do Feature film quality work and get a good get a good shot on their demo reel and do the shot breakdowns. They always want to see your shot breakdowns. So, um, and if you're having trouble with your shot breakdowns, we have a demo reel workshop where we can help you with your demo reels and your websites. But yeah, the, yeah. So the the idea is to provide uh, folks with an ability to move into or move up in the industry by building a better demo reel. But in compositing, you have to have elements. Uh, I remember when I was, I started off at 3D the first few years. Like I said, I was at Robert Abel and 3D was my thing. And, uh, you know, you can sit down to a blank screen and whip up a dinosaur. And you can just put that on your demo reel. But in in compositing, you can't do that. You have to have a green screen or you have to have a a digital matte painting or whatever. So that's why the importance of the shot kits for compositing folks. This is a great idea, and you know what? It's funny that you brought this up. I did not even see this on your website. Yes, but, I, I watched. Um, I it's it's really really smart, and this is exactly what the high end, uh, what I call go getter VFX schools are doing. Like for instance, uh, Lost Boys. Uh, what I love about that school is they uh, they they spend they have an entire team there dedicated to. Uh, shooting plate shots having plate shots available right. all of that and and not just that but explosion uh stock, stock explosion stock you know all that stuff shot by them 
Um, huh? And all the equipment, makeup artists, they do a lot of uh, stuff that's specifically just shooting really beautiful high-end, high-production plate shots. Right. Um, and that's something that I, obviously this is a, actually you know a wonderful idea. Uh, well, I've, so I've organized the shot kits into categories, okay? Um, so, yeah, there's cleanup. That's an entry-level thing. There's roto, okay? Uh, there are monitor insert shots. Um, so there's skills and there's creative shots. I've got some shots, horror and sci-fi, where some of the shots, some of these shot kits are designed for you to show your technical skill. I can roto. I can key. Some of them are designed to allow you to show your artistic creativity. I can make an explosion. I can make laser blasts. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, two, 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 two kinds there. There's about six or eight categories of shot kits there. And these are very, uh, I mean, th these prices are not without, you know, for, for anyone around the world. These are very, very low, low cost uh, prices. And to me, they'd be definitely worth, the, worth the buying and so forth. Um, and again, I'll say it again for those who haven't read it, uh, Digital Compositing and Film and Video Book. Again, it is the Bible of VFX. Don't be afraid. Don't think everything has to be done through a YouTube video or through online training. Uh, so much of what I learned about digital compositing, the science, and so forth, was through this book. So, And again, it is required text everywhere in every college uh, that I've ever seen uh, for VFX. Um, Gosh, thank you. Do you have any competition, man? Uh, well, uh, yeah, the, um, the art and science of uh, compositing visual effects. Oh, yeah, there's uh, that one, too. No, well, it's a very good book. I mean, mm -hmm. no getting around it. Okay. But uh, I don't know, what the hell is the author's name? I love that Ron guy. Brinkman. Ron Brinkman. Yeah, Ron Brinkman. Um, lovely fellow. Uh, in fact, he said he now is a professor somewhere. Are, do you, uh, where's he at now? Is he? Do I, I don't recall what school he's at. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so let me just, uh, let's, if you don't mind, let's jump back into just going through your history again here. Um, mm -hmm. So we got some interesting movies. Uh, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, Free Jack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Way back. Uh, horror, horror was a big market for visual effects. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. My goodness. Yeah, Fern <laughs> You know, you, you kind of have to isolate yourself from the uh, movie and focus on your shot and, and your technique. I remember the Batman and Robin. I did uh, uh, a lot of uh, some shots on the Batman and Robin movie. And then when the movie came out, I rented the DVD to watch it for the first time. And after 15 minutes, I had to turn it off. <laughs> could, I could not watch that movie. You'd be okay. surprised on how many visual effects people will tell you they never see the movies they work on. Uh, uh Unless someone forces it on them, you know. Right. <laughs> um, well, you're not responsible for the bad script or the bad directing or the lousy acting. You know, you can't help that. But my shot was great, you know. <laughs> we were watching the trailer for, uh, uh, oh, oh, what is it? Um, it's a Sega Genesis video game. They just made a trailer movie for it. What's the blue guy? Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. There, there's a new movie, that new trailer just came out, Sonic the Hedgehog or whatever. And uh, they're basically taking that old Sega Genesis character and making a whole movie with Jim Carrey. And uh, we, 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 you know, everyone's like, oh, you got to put it up. You know, I'm visual effects class. is like, look at this bad CG. Look at this. I'm like, first off, it's not bad CG. There's really good CG here. And I always, t I always tell them, like, this could be your first shot for your, you yeah. know, this, this little lightning shot here that looks really, you know, this Jim Carrey holding a stick with the lightning on it. You know what I mean? Like, that could be your first shot. That'll be the shot you're proud of. So we actually took... What I do is I always show my students the trailers, movie trailers that just came out because some of the compositing's not finished yet. Mm -hmm. And then I just go, see, see here, see here, see here, see here. And we... Sometimes we go even further. Like, we took the Star Wars Episode Seven trailer, which had a shot of the Death Star smashed into the sand, crashed into the sand, and we color-graded the gradient of the, uh, of the background so that it actually matched better. <laughs> <laughs> they're just, and they're kind of like they're, they're they're learning from all these trailers, which is I think is a really good teaching method. It's just like show uh -huh. trailers because the visual effects ain't done yet, you know. <laughs> right, so. it's an early state. You know, it's funny you mentioned turning uh, Sonic Hedgehog into into a movie. When uh, I started in video games at Atari, we turned movies into video games. <laughs> now we turn video games into movies. <laughs> yeah. 
ain't that the truth? Sort of an interesting historical perspective on things. <laughs> the uh, and then comic books. I don't know. That's it's a whole other yeah. story. Well, you know, um, Hellraiser three was one was one of my first horror movies, uh, and I used the Pixar on that and did a lot of uh, really nice Pixar stuff for the day. For the day, I I could I I have nuke. And I could do the same thing in one quarter of the time, ten times better. But, you know, at the time, right? Mm. Uh, so I, I was recently contacted by a, a guy who's writing a book, for some reason, on Hellraiser 3. So I'm going to be interviewing with him for the visual effects I did on Hellraiser 3 coming out of the book that will be coming out uh, here pretty soon on Hellraiser 3 visual effects. <laughs> Those movies were really visual. I, I I haven't seen them in a long time, but I remember them being yeah. unbelievably, first off, disturbing, and uh, but just very <laughs> very visual. And I, I I can't remember what part three is. I think that's when they brought on the entire entourage of all the characters. Uh, or was that part two? Uh, I'm trying. Yeah, to... that was Joey. Send me to hell. You know. <laughs> I used to be. I used to work at Blockbuster Video back way back in the oh, day, yeah. and I just remember all these old. One boxers and some, you know, <laughs> some of these uh -huh. vintage movies of the 80, 90s, uh, early nineties, and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just back in the day when there was uh, what was it, Vidmark? Remember those, uh, the Trimark? All those fun little companies. Right. Um, right. So the, 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 the bad old days of cheap movies. Mortal Kombat: The Journey Begins. I don't remember that oh. video game. Is that like a? You remember the game? I no, I don't remember the game. I you know when oh. I came into the Mortal Kombat franchise as a as a character artist, um, <gasps> it was just like, okay, there's five characters, right? They're like, no, there's like fifty. <laughs> I'm just like, what? <laughs> you know, so I I totally have from from the first game, or part one or part two of the original game up until uh, Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks was the first game I worked on. I don't, I didn't remember the history of the video games of, mm -hmm. ever since then. But maybe you can give me some background on the journey begins. Oh, actually, what that was was an interesting. Um, it was not the video game itself. Uh, they decided what they wanted to do was produce about a half-hour animated film. Okay, uh, for Mortal Kombat. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so now one of the things, we're back to the Pixar computer again here. Here's what happened. After we started compositing shots for people, I realized, uh, do you remember Disney's CAPS system? Yes. Okay. Well, it, it dawned on me one day that I could take line art, you know, uh, for animation they draw and sell frame by frame on paper, 12 field or 16 field paper, and... What I realized is I could scan that paper with a flatbed scanner, and then I could use image processing to darken the line art and then do a simple flood fill. Suddenly, I'm in the digital ink and paint business. <laughs> okay? Wow. I did, what, a dozen commercials and four or five feature films. Now, I only did the money shots, okay? They, they couldn't afford to do a whole film with me. But the, the point is that um, I had turned the Pixar computer into a digital ink and paint system. Uh, my wife, Diane, actually ran the digital ink and paint, you know, scanning the line art and all of that stuff and running the painters, and I would do all the compositing of the shots. Okay. Um, so the, the Mortal Kombat was an animated uh, 2D and 3D. What we did there was we scanned in the line art, did the digital ink and paint on the characters, but we also built some 3D environment. So we're mixing 2D and 3D together for this little animated uh, video. Wow. I early guess. work, very early work. <laughs> Please don't look at it. <laughs> <laughs> you, did, uh, you did the... Uh, now, when I see Air Force One, when I think visual effects Air Force One, I, I always imagine... Uh, uh, is it Gary Oldman getting kicked out of the plane? Is that is it that that's the the main visual effect shot I always think of? Did you work on that? Or? <laughs> well, um, an interesting story about Air Force One. Uh, don't tell anybody, but I never worked on it. Oh, you never did. No, I was working <laughs> at City Site. Yeah, I was working at City Site, and I had worked on a, a feature, and I didn't get credit for it. So. 
the management of the city site said, oh, uh, we'll make it up to you. We'll give you credit on Air Force One. <laughs> Jeez. I kid you not. That don't happen today, I tell you that much. No, no, not today. <laughs> the um, So you have uh, Rat Race 2001. Oh, set the Wayback Machine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, comedy. Yeah. That movie was weird, man. I, I remember seeing that yeah. movie. It was such a it was such an oddball it was almost like a Off train wreck. You had to watch it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The scripting, I mean, not the visual effects. I'm sure the visual effects were right. awesome. What did you do the visual effects wise on Rat Race? I'm just curious. Like, um Jesus Criminies. Um I've got, you know, <laughs> over seventy feature films and uh, fifteen hundred shots and uh Oh, that was Rat Race. Was that story? Oh, <laughs> this is this is great. Uh, rat. There's a Rat Race story. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. You know that in the early days we had the Cineon log images, right? Oh yeah. Even today, people don't grok log. Okay. <laughs> but back then, uh, you may have noticed in, in my book. I actually have in the earlier versions. I had a whole chapter on log images. I learned log from Glenn Kennel the color scientist at Kodak that invented it, okay? So I understood log. So here's what happened. Another production company had a shot for a uh, rat race, and they brought in the files, and they put them up on the monitor, and they were horrible. They, they were, the, the color space was completely screwed up. So I said, well, what did you do? Well, we, we converted it from log to linear so that you guys could shoot it on the film recorder, not realizing that in those days the film recorders took sitting on log images as the input, mm -hmm. right? So the, the results were hideous and awful. So what I did was I took their, their files and reverse engineered them back into log for them so that we could film it, and it came out perfectly. <laughs> wow. But in, in those, nobody nobody understood log. You know, even today, a lot of people don't get log. The uh, the the time machine that is an incredibly awesome movie. A great ode to the uh, the, the the previous time machine and the uh, was it the uh, uh, who who wrote the time machine? Boy, I'm being stupid right now. Um, um, yeah, a classic science fiction. Yeah, author. I'm like, who's that guy who wrote it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, my uncle Vinny. Um, <laughs> but I, I always remember growing up with the uh, seeing the nineteen what was it, 1958 version or some some version in the 50s, right. 60s, and that was always one that always. My dad introduced me some, to all the great science fiction movies, and so coming from his scientific background, and uh, right. so seeing the the new time machine, which did a great sort of like heads up. Um, do you mind talking about that? Because there was a lot of really awesome visual effect shots uh, in that, almost timeless visual effect shots in that movie. Yeah, that's an H.G. Wells movie, by the way. H.G. Wells, there we go. Yeah, right. Everybody knows um, my problem with names, so... It, the, the, like, by today's standard, you would have to call the CGI very primitive. <laughs> okay. Um, there was a problem, okay? We had... We had um, CineSite, I was working at CineSite at the time, of course, and the company was founded on this whole idea of scanning film. And then you give you the film scans, you do your thing, bring it back, and we'll shoot it out to film for you on the film recorders. Well, the, the problem was that when you scan the film, you got these log images. And the, our engineering department was trying to write CGI that would work with the log images. They had a terrible time, because the two are utterly incompatible, okay? <laughs> linear, CGI renders as a linear image. Uh, film scans are a log. How the hell do we get these two things to play nice together? So uh, I watched the <laughs> I watched the poor 3D department struggle with this for years, and they never got it right. Then I, got, I, went, to, um, I went to Nuke, and I read their white paper on their linear light space, and I went, oh, this is it. This is the answer. This is why CineSight could never get it right, because for two reasons. One, you must work in linear, and two, you must work in float. Back in those days at CineSight, we did everything in 10-bit log. Huh. So we, they were doomed, okay? <laughs> 
I got so excited when I, when I read the Nuke White paper because I was starting to teach Nuke. I got so excited about this. I said, wow, that's the answer. That's what went wrong at CineSight. I want to explain this to the world. So I wrote an article about how Nuke's linear light space works. And I sent it to the foundry. And I said, would you guys uh, have the boys check this out and make sure I told the story correct? They got back to me right away and said, yes, you told the story correct. Now, could, could you make a video of this for us? <laughs> so I did. And it's on, the, on their website today. Okay, how <laughs> Nuke's linear light space works. <laughs> And everyone, yeah, brought to you by City on Log. <laughs> the history, uh, you should do a whole movie called The History of Light Space, you know, in visual effects oh. or something. Well, right. color space is one of those things that people have a great deal of trouble with. Okay. Well, understandably so. It's, it's, well, it, I mean, when you think about all the different flavors we have today with this, you know, we, I mean, think about H, the, uh, uh, Asus. Yeah, Asus. I'm trying to get my, I'm still trying to get my head around Asus. There's very little training on that. Um, but everyone's like, we're an Asus now, and I'm like, well, I think I should be. So, and and but at the same time, for the beginner, it's like, well, you don't need to be an Asus just to learn what you're learning. But at the same time, I'm like, probably be a good idea. I know this is a lot of this is for digital archiving and having a wider gamut for future releases of stuff. Well, you know? that's really not its uh, main purpose. Um, I attended a seminar once by Charles Poynton. You, you know who he is? No, I do not. I'm sorry. He is, a, he is a huge color scientist. He helped write ICC profiles. He helped with Hewlett-Packard and color sRGBM. The guy's a giant in the industry. So he was putting on a, a seminar, and I paid 600 bucks to go sit in his seminar uh, for one day. And uh, he started his, his lecture on color science. And... There was only a, about a dozen or 15 people in the audience. One of them raises his hand. And Charles says, yes. And the question this guy answered was, what do we need color science for? <laughs> Poynton was, he was he froze in his tracks. I mean, he was, it was such a, my first thought was, what the hell are you doing in this room? You know, <laughs> ask that question. So Poynton was stuck. It was such a fundamental question. So I raised my hand, and he said, yes. I said to the other guy, if you work within a single color space pipeline, film in, film out, video in, video out, you don't need color science. It's all been taken care of for you. When you cross between color spaces, I want to put video into film or CGI into video, that's where you get into trouble. And Poynton says, yes, on the nosy, on the nosy. <laughs> Okay. So the whole idea of ACES is the ish, is the concept of being able to mix different source media. I, I all, all of us compositors have had the problem of my background plate is a film scan, my foreground character is a CGI render, I've got this digital matte painting from Photoshop, and the director wants this video put into the monitor. So you're you're blending mm. all of these different color spaces. So the overarching principle of ACES is we're going to take all those disparate sources back out of them, their, their, um, the baked-in uh, nature of their capture devices, the film, the, the uh, digital cameras, the film stock, convert, back that out, convert them to a neutral color space called ACES that represents the actual scene illumination literally and it's a linear space of course so nukes linear light space approaches aces and aces takes it to the whole next level hmm. nukes linear light space uh you you back out the lut in a srgb or a log image to put it into linear space but nuke does not then go the next step back out the camera's baked in influence that's what aces does okay gotcha so you have basically stripped out the camera's characteristics and produced an image that is the original raw photons from the scene. That's the idea. And then in order, to, you could do all your image processing in that space, so they made it a huge gamut, floating point, all kind of thing like that. But that's the fundamental uh, concept behind ACES, is I want to be able to mix different footages from different sources and have it look right, work right. 
Yeah, and the, but you know, even right now, they're still. I mean, it's it, it's an it's an effort worth doing, but um, they're still trying to refine out uh, the standard of Asus. Oh okay. yeah, you got the toe with no toe, you know, all that all that stuff. Um, but there's some tweaking and polishing to be done. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do you when, when in your opinion, when do you think they'll finally have like this is it, we're done? It's or will it always be changing into different versions of Asus or? Oh, well, it's, it's deployed now in most studios. Even video studios uh, are starting to use ACES. Um, when will it be done? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. It'll um, never be and, you know, it's an evolving target. It's a moving target because the needs of production are continually changing. Yeah, so the, um, the, uh, the needs of production are continually changing, so the ACES has to keep following that moving target. Gotcha. Okay. So just moving through the library, obviously, I, I, I don't want to be rude, like just, you know, jumping over, you know, so many years of history of that bring back a lot of fond memories. But um, I just kind of look for highlights. Um, Shutter Island, New Deal Studios. I've never heard of them. Are they? Oh, New Deal Studio. They're in uh, Hollywood and they're an interesting uh, concept. Uh, you know that that um, all of the studios had gotten rid of their practicals. Okay, their models and miniatures, their, their cloud tanks and all that. Everybody went digital. New Deal Studios kept one foot in the practical industry. Okay, so at New Deal Studios, you could get a model, a miniature, a MoCo camera shot. You could also get CGI and, and Nuke compositing. So that's who, who they were. Hmm. Yeah. So um, they, they, they just farmed out a couple of shots to me. Um, because, you know, just a little overflow work. That's all that was. But um, in, 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 uh, um, an interesting story uh, back to uh, the Atari days is the Superman 3 movie. Okay, do you see that down there? Way at the bottom. <laughs> that, yeah, that would be <laughs> way down there. There it is. Uh, here's what happened there. Um the Pinewood Studios, who was producing Superman 3, uh, wanted to put in a video game gag where the bad guy was shooting missiles at Superman and it would be presented on a big monitor of Superman as a graphic character, missiles firing at him, score points, points, points as they hit him, and like that was the gag, right? This was this was the one with um, the black comedian Richard, Richard, Richard Pryor. Pryor. Richard Pryor. So, Pinewood Studios wrote a letter because Atari was the video game uh, king of the planet at the time. Pinewood Studios wrote a letter to Warner Brothers saying, could you guys make some video game footage for our movie? And the C CEO of, of Time Warner handed it to the CEO of Atari, who then handed it to me. <laughs> Wow, I, I I I had a special project where I handled all the weird stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. so what what by coincidence uh, when this letter came down about making the footage, I had just completed a project. Um, back in those days, uh, we we wrote video games by hand coding 6502 assembler language. It took nine months or a year to write one video game. Then we would test it, and maybe it wasn't so good, maybe it was good. So I said, well, wait a minute, what we need is a game simulator. We need a rapid prototyping system where we can get the gameplay up very quickly and then test the gameplay before we spend a man year writing the code. Mm -hmm. So I proposed a project. This was in the days when Atari was just booming, okay? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure, Here, here's a couple of million dollars. Steve, go get them. It sounds like a great idea. Call me when you're done. So, when I hired what, three aerospace engineers, I got a Symbolics Lisp machine. You ever heard of that? No, yeah. oh, set the Wayback machine. You, you young people today. I'm 41. Anyway. I'm not that. I'm not that young. <laughs> um, the Symbolics Lisp machine. It was all the rage. It was an early artificial intelligence machine, and it was all the rage. In fact, there was a lot of CGI that was done on it. Okay. But the, the point of it was, it had a language that was object-oriented, which is what you want for writing the logic of a video game. So, 
that list machine became the CPU of my game uh, rapid prototyping system. Now, for the graphics chip, uh, I got an Iconis frame buffer, which was the size of a refrigerator, okay? <laughs> but it had a monitor, and the list machine could write into the frame buffer, and the frame buffer did all the graphics, okay? So now I had an Atari game machine, a CPU chip, and a graphics chip, okay? Man. But because we were programming in Lisp, we could prototype a game in two weeks. Oh, okay. Okay, so that was the concept. So I had just finished the rapid prototyping system when this letter comes down from, uh, from corporate about producing the footage for Superman 3. So I read the letter, I looked at my machine, and I said, yeah, if all I need is a film recorder, Okay, so buy me a film recorder, and I can make this for, for Pinewood Studios. Okay, only $50,000 for a film recorder. Here you go, Steve. Do it. So, um, so I bought a film recorder, and now here, here's the interesting thing. I did not know from film recorders, okay? Hmm. I had to hire somebody to come in, set up the film recorder, and calibrate it with the Iconis frame buffer and the Symbolics list machine. The guy that I hired at the time was a guy named Carl Rosendahl who was the head of PDI who was one of the founding fathers of computer animation. PDI Studios was very, very big back then. Anyway, so he came in and, and set up my machine for me. He did a fine job too. Uh, and so we then, using the rapid prototyping system, uh, we designed all kinds of scenes and then shot them out from the Iconis frame buffer to the uh, film recorder and sent the film to um, Pinewood Studios and it's up on the big screen. That's interesting. <laughs> so that, that was my the first foray works. into the movie industry from the video game industry. Okay. It's, it's interesting how, um, you know, the, the shifting of technologies almost are, some of them are, uh, were never consciously meant to be uh, some of the tools that we we have today are are brought forth through just mixing technologies like for instance I always bring up the DSLR revolution with all the people like the whole reason why DSLRs existed uh, was a 24 frames per second way for journalists to actually if they're in Iraq or whatever send the footage off to NBC and that's why they started developing the DSLRs to have the 24 frames per second video mode from which every all the filmmakers, you know, grabbed the hold of and said, oh my gosh, the heck with these other cameras, you know, we have these photographic, filmic, shallow depth of field cameras that we can use, you know. So there's mm -hmm. all these, like, technologies that just, like, you start out with, you use them for this purpose, and they end up becoming another purpose or being used in another, you know, element. Yeah, yeah no, we get... We get a lot of that um, in, you know, in, in, in the movie industry. We develop the technology for uh, motion tracking, for, for you know, camera tracking a scene. Well, then the um, ge the geology department, the federal government said, "Whoa, we can use this technology to do all kinds of wonderful things." So it, it gets it gets brought from the movie industry into uh, science and industry. So there's an exporting of movie technology, and then there's an importing from other industries um, although you know mocap motion capture is a very very big in the film industry it's really heavily used in the gaming industry yep yeah so i think some of our most advanced mocap people are from video games and it used to be that the big dream of a of video gamer would be to break into the movie industry well, today now you got movie people being hired into the video game industry. When I when I worked at Nether Realm, um, a lot of the animators that were doing the mocap for the games for Mortal Kombat are now animating uh, uh, are at Weta Digital, and they're um, they're animating like uh, Planet of the Apes movies, uh, Gollum, and the latest uh, um, in the previous Lord of the Rings uh, Hobbit movies and so forth. So I got to work with. It was interesting coming from a game background as my start and seeing everybody's transition to and also seeing guys from film come into the game industry that were veterans that I learned from uh, that were like we had one guy his whole job was like just cameras that's all he did 
cameras and because he was a great cinematographer and to this day he works for uh like work he's worked on star wars and all this and uh he is he's an amazing amazing cinematographer and i and i brought him in i you know i said he i said hey have you ever done this in in, Ma- in maya before and he's like i don't know anything about Maya. all i know is that camera <laughs> And, my, and all I do is, and it was very traditional lockdown tripod shots in a, in virtual space. And I was like, right. why don't you just take the camera and whip it around like this? It's like, you you <laughs> dummy. You don't understand cinematography, you know. And well, the interesting thing about cinematography cameras is the lens on the camera, as you, as you know, the lens element is made up of several pieces of glass. Mm-hmm. And those pieces of glass, uh, they're trying to compensate for chromatic aberration. And they, so it's a complex chunk of, of lens. But in, when you render a picture in CGI, they use what's called the thin lens model. There are no lens artifacts in a CGI render. Okay? And that mechanical optical lens on the camera is adding a whole bunch of footprint okay, baked into that captured image. And so one of the things you got to know as a compositor is how to duplicate lens artifacts. And I'm not talking about the obvious, like lens flares. That's Tinker Toys. Mm -hmm. But the usual, the other more subtle lens sprites, chromatic aberration, spherical aberration, astigmatism, okay? And don't even get me started on um, cinemascope lenses. You know, I was going to ask you about cinescope i was going to ask you specifically about this latest uh fat i I don't know if called fat or whatever but um trend my website is vfx for filmmakers and i'm trying to uh, filmmakers today uh are now getting into anamorphic uh lenses anamorphic uh cheat boxes or just like lenses you put in with the taking lens and so forth and um, they're asking, you know, we're kind of asking ourselves, like, oh, can we track this? Is it so warped? Because there are rigs that are like uh, like a magnifying uh, uh, super scope at the front end here. You've got your anamorphic lens giving you spherical distortion. And then you have your taking lens, which is giving you sp- uh, um, spherical distortion. Then you have anamorphic distortion. And then you have another magnifier to get the wide angle. So how in the world can you even track that stuff? You know, I mean, and how, you know, uh, can cameras figure out that kind of stuff today? Well, I, you know? I can speak to Nuke's camera tracker. Mm-hmm. Cannot speak to Synthize or PF Track, but the Nuke camera tracker resolves the lens distortion into a single mathematical equation. Okay. And but what they're really trying to do is concatenate all the lenses that are in that, uh, all the, the glass elements in that lens concatenate into a single model of that lens. The problem is when you start throwing in all these compound multiple, bolt this onto that, onto that, onto that, you now are way outside of what the lens model can handle. So the Nuke camera tracker would not do well on a thing like that. But like it I seems said, like 3D equalizer is the way to go for anamorphic uh, type workflow. Um, I don't know how it works yet. I'm actually thinking about learning it uh, myself. Um, I haven't fiddled around yet, but I feel this is the big jump to kind of understand it. But I, I'm actually in the process of purchasing an anamorphic adapter from anamorphicstore.com. Mm-hmm. And it allows, I, I just bought a Blackmagic Pocket 4K. And this, this is, it's wow. revolutionary that you can take that put this thing on, you know, put this, these elements on the front of it, and you can get anywhere from 19 to 85 millimeter anamorphic, you know. Oof. So, yeah. Well, what the film industry did, uh, they moved away from anamorphic. You have an old guard that loves the anamorphic look, okay? But if you really wanted to produce an anamorphic uh, movie, what, what they wound up doing is they would use a prime lens, and they would shoot the 35 millimeter film, full aperture. Okay, not shooting at academy aperture, but full at perf to perf. Then in comp, we would crop out the uh, 239 uh, Mm. image out of the middle of the full aperture. By the way, you know it's 239, not 235? Yeah, I've been going back and forth with that one. (laughs) Okay, well, here's the backstory. When it was first 
when the spec was first put out, it was mm. 2.35 aspect ratio. Uh, the problem was that that took the top of the film too close to the splices, and you would occasionally mm. see a splice in the frame. So they changed the spec to 239, which means that it was not quite as tall. I see. So that you wouldn't see your splices in the film anymore. So and it's been that way. Uh, Simpty changed the spec in, in what, somewhere in the, in the 70s or something, okay? But everybody thinks of it as 235, but it is now 239. However, it is now academic because there's no more film, no more film splices. <laughs> yeah, I was going back and forth. I was like, is this supposed to be 239, 235? Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> with the, the, the uh, and it was, it, it, I tell you, even teaching visual effects for so long, mostly as a generalist and, you know, all types of Houdini and all that, but finally getting a head, my head around anamorphics, I like the look of it. I think it's cool. It has a kind of a slightly squashy feel to it. Uh, I, I always call it like a la Alien 3 or something. Um, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, you get some really interesting lens, uh, 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 lens flares out of it. You can cheat those with optics. I mean, people are always saying, like, uh, people were thinking it was blasphemy that the latest Blade Runner movie was shot spherically, but not anamorphically like the original, mm -hmm. which I thought was rather interesting because I went back to the movie. I go, wait, this is spherically. You know, Roger Deakin shot this spherically. And you look at it, it's just cropped, you know, um, but it looks beautiful. You know, there's, you know, there, I, I look at both looks, I go, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm kind of in between the two worlds. And I found that... Uh -huh. um, with the black magic, because it shoots uh, 16 by 9, um, they allow for these filters now. They allow you to do a 1.33 or 1.55 crop, uh, a squish. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the anamorphic look with the lens flares and slight bo oval bokeh, but at the same time, you're also getting a spherical interpretation that's a little bit less distorted. You know what I mean? Well, you're getting uh, that you, panorama look, but you're not losing, right. you know. Well, uh, let, let me tell you my thoughts on this issue. Uh, I was on a shoot once, Toyota car commercial, and the, uh, the DP uh, started to put a, a tobacco filter in the camera, okay? Mm -hmm. And I said, don't do that. I can add that in post. What you're doing is you are subtracting data from the scene captured that, that I need in post. In other words, that tobacco filter is baked in. Mm -hmm. okay? Same thing is going on with these lenses. Today, we can simulate any film stock, any lens model, any lighting model you want, and then consider also, so in other words, you don't have to shoot it with an anamorphic. We can give it an anamorphic treatment in mm -hmm. post now. But here's the real punchline. You talked about a camera with a spiffy uh, anamorphic lens, but now here comes the CG. Yeah. It's not anamorphic. Or they had a second unit chopped. It wasn't anamorphic. And now you've got to fit all that stuff together. Some shot with a real anamorphic lens, some shot with a prime, and some is, uh, with a CG. If you'll shoot everything plain, then we can bring it all together in post and give it all a uniform treatment that looks as anamorphic as you wish. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm, I, you're, I think you've just convinced me not to buy this kit because <laughs> I'm kind of like, you probably could get, get away with planar tracking cleanup, uh, yeah. but I, I was thinking about camera solving. I'm like, is this even worth my investment of money? <laughs> I don't know. I, I was kind of like, I, I like the look. I thought it'd be cool, but I don't want to spend $15,000 on an anamorphic official lens. You know what I mean? Right. Um, right. So, or I could just rent one, you know. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of sure like, somebody who makes a plug-in, do you use After Effects or Nuke? Yes. What do you use? Nuke After Effects. I teach, I'm actually teaching an After Effects course right now. And I'm I sure teach, somebody makes a plug-in lens model plug-in that you can buy. They'll make it as anamorphic as you want. Yeah, but well. here, here was the problem with the DPs. You know, I had told you the story about the tobacco filter. Yeah. The problem was in, in the transition from film to digital. Okay, and I was there. When I started, it was all film. When I finished, it was all digital. The whole pipeline is now capture, processing, distribution, presentation. It's all digital now. But here, here was the problem in that transition for the DPs. In film days, the DP made his living because he knew 
what this film stock would look like with that lens under these lighting conditions. He was the only guy that understood that. So his, his skill, his knowledge, his experience, his mental library was extremely valuable and important. But now here comes digital. You can shoot it flat and plain, and we'll make it look any way you want. All of a sudden, his knowledge is no longer useful. <laughs> so that's why the DPs resisted this whole digital... <laughs> there are some, like J.J. Abrams really loves film, uh, the film look, but... Uh, we can give anything a film look. But back to my main point about merging disparate elements from different sources, okay? You, you, can't, uh, if you can't shoot them all with the same lens. So by shooting them clean, bringing them together in post, think of it as the optical version of ACES. ACES is a color space thing, okay? Mm -hmm. But this is sort of like um, an ACES for the look, for look dev, for look development. Okay. Fix it in post. <laughs> I, gave, I gave a talk to the Digital Cinema Society once. Uh, they're a bunch of shooters now, okay? Mm -hmm. Digital Cinema Society. And what the talk was, was shooting green screens. And I said, today I'm going to tell you, because I'm the guy who gets your green screens, okay? I'm the guy who has to fix it. So I'm going to tell you how to shoot your green screens real good. But please ignore my advice. Because when you shoot a lousy green screen, you have to pay me to fix it. Okay. <laughs> now, the problem is, they, that's, that's another problem in, in the industry in general, not just film, is the DP, they don't like the green screen really good because, you know, well, they, we can fix it in post. Because, you know, they got computers, you know. Well, yes, we can fix it in post. But it'll cost more and it won't look as good as if you had shot it well. But yeah, we can fix it in post. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll pay for it. Yeah, we did. A, I just uh, worked on a series of Capital One commercials with Sam Jackson, um, mm. and uh, we were doing the comping work throughout the whole process. And uh, it was shot on the Airy, um, and um, Airy Alexa. Yeah, Airy Alexa four to three aspect ratio. So we reframed it for sixteen by nine for TV. Um, but it was it was him on a full green screen set. A uh, huge cyclo cy cyclorama, whatever you call it. Um, psych, yeah. Psych. Yeah. And uh, cyclorama. we were looking, we were doing all the comp work halfway through it. We, we you know, we, f we finally realized, uh oh, we looked at one of the channels and there was like a line artifact or something. And we went back to the colorist. He's like, oh crap, I, I converted this wrong or something. So we had to do the whole thing over again. You know, I always tell my students, like, look at your footage before you start keying it. Look at the grain. Oh, yeah. Look at the, see what you're dealing with before. Look at the individual RGB channels, you know. Yeah. You, you're not, but it wasn't the Aerie that did this. Uh, apparently it wasn't because he got, he, okay. he sent us the footage back in. I don't know if it was some conversion of color space or something, mm -hmm. uh, but he we got it back and he was apologizing and we just had to we basically had to redo our keys, which was uh, we were only a I couple love, weeks in. So I, I love the airy. Uh, the thing about airy that is magical and different is, and this is especially important for green screen, is you know how much problem noise or grain is in trying to key a shot, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the airy is particularly clean in the darks. And the reason it is, is they actually have a solid state chiller plate behind the imaging sensor to chill it down, keep it cold. So you don't get thermal noise in your image captures. Okay? Huh. So they have unusually clean darks. In fact, uh, I was at, uh, at the NAB show several years ago. I, I would do um, dog and pony shows for the foundry at, at NAB, right? So Ari had a booth at NAB. They came trotting over to the foundry and said, hey, can we have one of your new guys come over and, and evaluate some new Ari footage? We just shot a bunch of green screens. We'd like your opinion. And the foundry people said, we're not going to give you any of our staff. <laughs> okay. But they said, well, Steve is here. So uh, they took me over to the Airy booth, and they had shot a whole bunch of blue screens and green screens with this new Airy camera, and they gave me a whole bunch of different shots at different exposures, and my mission was to evaluate them and write them a report, which I did. 
and they got very favorable reviews. It was beautiful stuff. Mm. It's interesting. Uh, I've so so many times throughout history, whenever I'm trying to find a new technology or how to understand a new technology, the the road always leads back to you. Like I was learning 2D, 3D conversion. Like, where is this? There's nothing on this. And then, sure enough, I, I found a video on uh, online. I think it was on Linda or something. Um, of you discussing the 2D, 3D conversion process. Oh, of no, that would have been a video for the Foundry. The Foundry, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I never did one for Linda. I'm sorry. Uh, the Foundry yeah. asked me to make a video on the 2D, 3D conversion process. Yes, yes, well, that's funny. <laughs> and I, that. I, I, back when 3D was big uh, and I was uh -huh. still I was teaching, uh, we, we actually tried to, we did some 2D, 3D conversion. And uh, surprisingly, those compositors are... Currently, uh, VFX compositing leads at uh, on uh, over at uh, Industrial Lights and Magic. Surprisingly, oh. <laughs> um, well, you know what the, what the burner is on stereo conversion uh -huh. is. Let me ask you this question: Is it 3D or is it stereo? What's the right term here? Uh -huh. Well, here's the problem: the industry splits in production. Again, let's set the Wayback Machine for the 1950s. Okay. This is where all the terminology starts, anyway. They would shoot the film in stereo, and they would edit it in stereo. They would color time it in stereo. But then when it went to the theater, the theaters called it 3D. And this is why we have this terminology conflict, okay? <laughs> is it stereo? Is it 3D? Well, so 3D is the term for display. For, for the display of the movie, even um, the TVs, they're 3D ready, you know. But we, we really should get the industry to, to turn over to stereo because 3D already has significant meaning, you know, polygons, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah everybody needs to call it stereo, okay? The, um, <laughs> I think uh, due to time, um, I'm, I'm going to... Um, you know, I'll just kind of throw it out there. Is there so many movies you've worked on and so forth? Is there any specific movie that was very memorable to you in your career or, 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 or job that you find was pretty much? I also see you got some awards behind you as well. Did you want to talk about those at all? Or? Well, uh, yeah, I've, I've won a few awards here and there. Um, but uh, I think the award that I am most proud of was in 2014. I won the Simpty Educational Award. CCIR 601, SIMTI spec, and so on and so forth. So SIMTI is the engineering group that defines, this is where they wrote the HDTV stuff, okay? Mm. So I got an educational award from SIMTI. Think of it as an Oscar for nerds. <laughs> cool. So that's one, one of my, oh, the, the interesting thing, I was delivering my acceptance speech uh, with a little bit unnerving, um, at, at that same SIMTI awards meeting was, was George Lucas. He was there to get a lifetime award from SIMTI for all the fabulous technology developments. So I'm delivering my silly little acceptance speech with George Lucas sitting 20 feet in front of me. Okay. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so the, the way I handled it was I just completely looked past him. He, he was not in the room, okay? I spoke to the rest of the room. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. He's actually in, he lives in Chicago uh, right now, where Ooh. I'm at, and uh, some of my students who are working at ILM actually waited on him uh, as, oh. as, uh, as waiters. <laughs> like, they're day jobs. <laughs> yeah, and now they're working on, uh, they're working on yeah. Star Wars, you know, so it's just very strange, small world. Yeah. Um, yeah. I believe him and his him and his wife moved moved out here, so I've been here, and he's been like hanging out at fancy restaurants and so forth. Uh, I think he's I, I think he can afford fancy restaurants. Yeah. Okay, so these are just a couple of questions that I have, and then we'll have a question by um, somebody in our tech talk that has posted earlier, and then we have a Regis Saps reel. Um, for those of you out there that I have links at the bottom of every one of these interviews uh, for uh, questions. Uh, and I uh, currently we could use a couple more questions and uh, tech talk questions that are more technical based. And then we have <clears throat> the real talk where we actually critique uh, with positive but brutal criticism 
of your reels just to give you advice. And uh, we have a reel here by uh, one pers person named uh, Regis Zapp. So my questions, I only have a couple here. Uh, you probably have one of the greatest sort of uh, bird's eye view and understanding the history of visual effects. So I always try to stay, what's the state of the union or lack of in regards to the VFX industry? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, broad topic. Um, I, I, I think the, uh, the big issue is its fragmentation and dissipation around the planet. Uh, that's what affects people the most. Um, the, the knowledge is being transferred to lower cost countries uh, first of all, it was India. Um, I actually went to India 11 times to teach visual effects, 11 different trips to India. And, and, and I used to think about it, gee, is this, you know, am I short-circuiting you know, my career or my colleagues' careers? But um, I told myself, my conclusion was, if I didn't do it, first of all, somebody else would. So mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter if it's me or somebody else. It's going to happen. The other point is, that it's also the natural evolution of things, so it's going to happen. So in the early days of cell animation, uh, they used to send their cell animation to Japan. They had really cheap labor, and they would labor and they'd draw the cell animation. Now Japan outsources to Vietnam. <laughs> okay. mm. So India became uh, the place we would outsource to. Well, as India uh, increased their skill and their artistic ability, their 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 quality went up and up and up. Now, China is the new India. This is unfortunately a natural evolution. Um, in the steel industry, you have to work in the steel plant. You can't pick up your toys and go to another country. Okay, but unfortunately, in our industry, um, if I don't like your prices, I'm going to source them in Vietnam or China or uh, somewhere else. So this puts a lot of pressure on the artists. It also drives down wages. Okay, domestic uh, production companies have to control their costs. So when when I got hired into CineSight, these are the very early days, of course. Very few artists. I was hired in at CineSight at ninety thousand dollars a year back then. Okay, so but today um, you can't get anywhere near that kind of money because of this downward pressure on the cost of the visual effects. Uh, the only places that really can control the situation are uh, the, the giants like ILM and Weta Digital that are so good you cannot outsource what they do <laughs> anywhere else. Okay. Agreed. So it, it's, it's really kind of an economic, uh, you said what's the most important influence, and I, I think it's the economics of this and trying to stay alive as an artist in the industry. Uh, I had Bob Coleman, who's a, his, he is a, an agent to find work for artists, okay? And he's got hundreds of uh, clients in the visual effects industry. And he said, today, to work in the industry, you need a demo reel and a visa. <laughs> okay. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Short and sweet. Um, yeah, this has been echoed a, a lot through uh, different uh, folks that have been on the on the program here. Um, yeah. I always ask, uh, especially from someone of your experience, where do you see it going? Where do you see the forecasts? Whether it's doom or and 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 if it's doom or gloom, I guess you know. I'm not nobody. Some people say doom or gloom. Some people will say, and it depends on who you are. You're from India. I mean, you and I. We, we, we have training that we sell, and I don't know if you've noticed, but I've seen a lot of receipts from India uh, mm -hmm. more than anything. And I'm like, wow, okay. So um, yep. China, and uh, now I'm seeing more and more South Korea um, more than anything, too. Um, very little. I, and China. China's, a, 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 like, the, uh, the, the tutorials I sell through China are through the roof. I mean, just absolutely through the roof. And I got to pay you Chinese taxes and all that. Uh, but. You don't worry about copyright infringement or theft of your materials. Um, I actually work through a subsidiary company that actually has legally uh, that legally protects me and also protects the materials themselves. So it was a long legal process to make sure everything was secure. And most major VFX houses 
uh, and most VFX, I'm sorry, major VFX artists that are on there from Industrial Lights and Magic to all these other uh, big conglomerates um, are uh, totally, um, they, they've vouched for it. They have no problem with it. They do some severe copyright protection uh, for it uh, as well as um, uh, for pirating as well. Speaking of pirating, you were talking about Vietnam. I heard this one story from a friend of mine who worked on Titanic. Uh, I taught with her for a semester, and she said that uh, Autodesk uh, actually uh, sent one of their suits to a company in Vietnam, and they only had one copy of Autodesk, uh, Maya. So they went over there, and there were cinder blocks set up for all of the uh, the workers <laughs> uh, to do all the visual effects work. And when they came, when he, when the when the guy in the suit came into the office to the owner and says, uh, "Yeah, we see you only have one copy of Maya, but you have about a zillion people out there working on Maya." So what he did was he he put down the copy of Maya, the box, the Autodesk Maya, set it down, and put a gun on top of it and said, "Yeah, we have our copy of Maya. Thank, th <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're good." And so he ran out of there. <laughs> Covered, yeah. <laughs> I, that story I love bringing up because man, it's just like that company eventually went under. I forgot the name of it, uh, uh, but they were a visual effects house based in Vietnam. But this, those kind uh, of stories really kind of make you think sometimes. But yeah, coming back to West. the future, what's your opinion forecast wise? Well, I'll tell you, uh, I see the future moving into three general directions. You will always have the glamour studios, the ILM, the Weta Digitals. Uh, for two reasons. One, they have unparalleled creative artistic people. And two, they have fabulous technology development. They can invent new software that a, a middle-sized company can't. Then you're going to have your, I don't want to use the term second tier, but everybody else, okay, uh, that have moved into the core staff project contract thing. So the, this visual effects company may only have 20 people that are permanent party, but they might ramp up to 150 for a movie by doing contract people. So they, they expand and contract on a contract basis as required for the project. The third group, I call that a man and a machine. We are reaching the point with the power of the computers and the, and the power of the software, the speed of the internet, the size of, the, of our disk space, the bandwidth of our connections, and the invention of the cloud, we are approaching a point where it could be entirely doable to do all the effects for a movie with everybody sitting at home. Yep. Yeah, we were discussing the Ready Player One scenario, and everybody's uh, just awaiting, from what I was told, the uh, was the Cisco boxes and the copyright protections and all that. And do you see that as a reality very soon, 10 years, oh, 5, yeah. 10? Oh, yeah. To a degree, it already starts now. Right now, the way you see it is uh, a studio has got uh, you know, their permanent party and then their, their project hires, but they need a little overflow or they need some special camera tracking. There's an outside guy who works at home. They'll farm that shot out to him. Okay? So you have a lot of that kind of, of uh, business going on. That model is going to grow. And the reason I know it's going to grow is because it's intrinsically cost-effective. It is vastly cheaper for me to farm out my stuff to a bunch of guys sitting at home than it is for me to build a building, install air conditioning, install electricity, buy a bunch of computers, bring people in, have an HR department, you know, insurance. yeah, and insurance and all that jazz. That, that triples my costs to making a movie. But if I can, it's, it's, it's called ooh, the Uber of visual effects, okay? A bunch of individual people, you know, driving their own cars, uh, making money, okay? So we're headed for the Uber of visual effects. And the, my, my thesis is quite simple, that it is so cost effective, it's inevitable. <laughs> okay? The and only... The, the way the that only plays option. out is going to be interesting when a bowl of rice in... You know, say uh, Colorado costs X amount, and a bowl of rice in uh, some, th you know, like India or something costs a, a certain X amount, and I don't need this much money compared to this guy here and there. Right. You know. <laughs> so. What What is the remaining piece of the of the puzzle here 
is to figure out how to manage and coordinate such a thing properly, okay? But we're getting there, and we'll get it. It, 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 like I said, it's inevitable because it's so cost-effective. So are we talking dystopia or utopia? <laughs> well, no, it, it's, um, uh, it's, it's an ideal arrangement okay. for me. I could sit at home. Here's the deal. If, and I, 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 students have this all the time. I'll have a student who's in a small city in Norway, and there's no visual effects studios there. Mm-hmm. For him to get a job, he's got to pick up his toys and move to London. Mm-hmm. Well, no. Okay. Um, I want to sit at home and do my work and, and make a good living that way. So that's, that's what this does. Um, it's, like I said, it's inevitable because it's cost effective. Now, not all of production is going to go there. We're going to have the three branches. Okay. The glamour companies, the ILM, the Weta Digitals, you're going to have the, the mainstream visual effects companies, the cine sites, the DNEGs, the MPCs. But more and more, you're going to have these freelance guys sitting out there in the cloud doing their work at home. That's going to become larger and larger and more prevalent over time. Do you, do you believe there's a certain element of a physical... Uh like you're physically with a person to look over your shoulder and help you versus looking over your shoulder via online. Um, is there a big difference there? Or do you think somebody doesn't necessarily have to start out at a studio as a low level junior comper and then finally have the strengths enough to work independently and have meetings independently via Skype and all these other sessions and having that model work? Uh, is it? That- well, you've asked two questions there. Okay. And um, the first question is about somebody getting into the industry. Should they start in a studio first? And the answer is yes. Because in that studio, two important things will happen. One, you'll learn about production. That's a different body of knowledge than knowing which button in Nuke to gain up the picture. Second of all, um, you're talking about the camaraderie, the shared knowledge, the shared experience. Yes, that's a problem. Sitting at home, I'm banging away on my machine. If I was, if I had a, a guy in a cubicle next to me, I got stuck. I could just leave. Hey, Fred, how do you get rid of this uh, dark line around my comp? But uh, sitting at home, that's problematic. But I'm envisioning the technology evolving to the point where the team will be online with each other constantly. So I'm banging away. I got a problem. I can just click on Matt's icon. Hey, Mac, could you look at this for me? Uh, what do you think's going on here? And then Matt would turn around and say, "Oh, you big dummy, you did a double pre-multiply down there." Oh, thank you. Okay. So the beginning will be like 5G and these increased network uh, so that we yeah. can literally be like full 4K display back and forth without any lag, without any issue. It's literally like, here, I'm gonna, you're gonna pop my screen up. There's going to be no connectivity issues. Not that this is already going on right now, but... Well, 5G um, is, is a uh, cell phone thing. It's not to do with the Internet. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. With the Internet, I, you know, I have 100, 100, gig, uh, 100 gigabits per second. Um, it's not really a bandwidth problem because, remember, the, the job, this is, this is the freaky part, the, the scan frames, the comps, and the software are all going to be re- resident on the cloud. Hmm. I'm just going to have a smart terminal, if you will, that I can look at my pictures on my monitor. Now, if I'm working, I can work on a 4K or an 8K job, but I I don't need to see anything more than a 2K picture. Okay, I don't have to look at a 4K plate at 4K. Okay? I mean, unless I'm trying to zoom in and do very fine edge details. But the point is that um, when, when once you get that model, that all the machinery is up here. And I just have a little viewport into my shot. That's all I need. And e- even if it, if it was a true 4K plate and it can't stream 4K, although they're working on it, <laughs> with Gig E you could do 4K in real time. But the point is, even if I couldn't do 4K in real time, I can download it to my workstation in 30 seconds and then play it back at 4K on my workstation. Gotcha. If I had a 4K monitor. But um, th- this whole notion that I have to have a big, bad computer and big software is not going to be the future. The big software and the big computers are going to be up there, 
and I'm just going to be, my, my workstation is just a viewport into, oh, what have you there? Ah. <laughs> the, okay. um, the one last, um, yep. before we close up with my questions, uh, 4K, 8K, your opinion of all that for VFX uh, work? Okay. Um, 4K, uh, it, it, 4K is not twice the resolution, it's four times the resolution, <laughs> okay? For a 4K plate, you've got 2K, 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 all right? So it's four times the data, four times the bandwidth. It ain't four times the picture. Um, a 4K, there's been study on by digital projectors in theaters, okay? You um, cannot see the difference between a 2K and a 4K image any further back than the fifth row. You have to get closer than the fifth row to see a, a visible difference. Interesting. Right. Yeah. So now we got TV. Um, you got your 4K TV. By the way, they're not 4K. They're UHD, ultra high def. 4K is 4096 pixels. Mm -hmm. UHD or 4K TV is really two HD TVs, 1920, 1920. Hmm. So it's really 3840 wide instead of 4096 wide. Hmm. At any rate. Um, so the, the, the JND, the just noticeable difference, okay, <laughs> is uh, it's not that great. It would be greater for television, though, I must say, because of the viewing distance. Hmm. Okay? Especially as time moves on, I now, in the living room, I now have a 65-inch flat panel, okay? And I'm only sitting 10 feet back from it. So in the movie theater, movie theater was designed for a 15-degree viewing angle of, from, from the eye. It covers that much of your field of view. Standard deaf television covered 6 degrees. Hmm. Well, HDTV is back to that 50... HDTV in resolution is approaching film quality. But what's really exciting about television is the new, is the new uh, P3 specs. Uh, we're going to see, it's one thing to have as many pixels as you have on the movie screen. Mm -hmm. But we don't have anywhere near the color and the dynamic range in my home TV that we do in the theater. Mm -hmm. Okay, a big Christie 4K projector, blow your retina out. Well, the new P3 specs, the, they're, they're a new UHD, Ultra, um, no, HDR TVs are just around the corner. 10 bits per pixel, 10 bits per channel. High dynamic range, okay? With, with, color, with, with a color gamut that frankly exceeds the color gamut for your digital projectors in the theater. So the future is uh, home theater P3, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Rick, Rick, um, I want to say 18, uh, Rick 2020, I think is, yeah, Rick 2020 is this spec. So it's, it's not just res resolution, but it's also frame rate and color space and, and primary chromaticities are going to actually exceed what you see in the theater. What, what are the difficulties as a compositor dealing with that resolution, that color gamut? the HDR workflow. Is there any big difference? Yes, yes, you bring up a really good point. Uh, from a compositing standpoint or any image processing, first of all, the high resolution is a pain in the butt because my computer takes longer. So we have to work in proxies, okay? Mm -hmm. Proxies are fine for most activities except uh, when you want to uh, check the edges of your key. You know, then you should be looking at it at full, full res. But you have the increased picture detail means that my keys have to be every little hair now okay shows up in the key shows up on the screen so I have to be much more careful in my keying rotoscoping is now much more painful because it has to be more accurate <coughs> uh, and then the high dynamic range is a problem for my workstation remember my workstation is a stupid little rec uh, uh, sRGB monitor mm -hmm. and I'm looking at an image on my with the room lights on I'm looking at an image the dynamic range of my display might be 900 to 1 
but in the theater with a dark surround and a 4K Christie projector, it's 5,000 to 1. Hmm. So what I'm trying to do is view that display on my silly little monitor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, what happens is, and this happens to compositors all the time, this is why I teach them gamma slamming, okay? <laughs> when you comp your shot, when you think you're finished, grab the viewer gamma and crank it up. Because what will happen is your darks come up, right? Yep. You composited this character over the background, and you had a great match in the black level. They were beautiful. You blast the gamma up, and all of a sudden, your character pulls away from the background. Mm -hmm. Because he was, he was off by 1%. But when you slam the gamma up, it now becomes 20%. That's exactly what happens in DI. Your shot goes to DI. The colorist, always trying to make it look cooler, right? Cooler means more contrast. <laughs> so they start cranking the picture, okay, making it more contrasty, more contrasty. Punchy. And then you go in, into, the, into the projection rooms, and you have these gigantic projectors with enormous dynamic ranges, high contrast ratios, and your picture falls apart. So the shot gets kicked back from the DI studio back to the visual effects shop. You never, ever, never, ever want to have that happen. So the, the two ways to prevent that is do the gamma slamming. We use, you know, gamma slam it up and drop the game down. Check it in the highs, middles, and lows. Pull on it. Stretch it. Kill it every way you can because you don't, you don't want the DI guy to find your problems. Just yesterday I was teaching a class. I think you own the copyright on the term slam the gamma. <laughs> Gamma slamming. Gamma slamming. Gamma slamming. Yes, I, I put that in my I'm book. like, take yes. that gamma, whip it around, because we're doing green screen right now. Uh, yeah. And uh, I said, you see, you see the black, see, the, see this, see that? And they're like, oh, yeah, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. especially since in, when you're dealing with uh, real compositing in the industry where they, they don't, uh, you know, they, they, there's, there's no normalization of the image. They don't, uh, they don't uh, whatchamacallit, clamp the whites. So... You know, you're dealing with all of this data, and, all, and it's just like got to make sure. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. let's uh, let's take a look at this guy's reel, if you don't mind. And we're jumping around okay. here. Um, we did mm -hmm. have a question by Matthias Backman. He's basically asking, "What's the best 3D tracker?" Uh, I, he. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I'm a nuker. Yeah, I love nuke too. Okay, um, I don't use PF Track or Synthize or any of those. Um, now, to be honest, people ask me, well, how good is Nuke's tracker? Um, Pretty good. I say it's, it's, it's an excellent $2,000 camera tracker. Mm. Okay. <laughs> it's not as robust as Synthize or... Um, 3D Bougie. Equalizer or what's the other yes. one? Yeah, and, and now, uh, when you buy a dedicated motion. camera tracker, uh, when I... I mean, it's been a few years since I looked up Buju, but in those days, oh, they wanted gosh. 18 grand for their camera tracker software. Okay. It would take 20 years to render. Yes, yes. Well, don't forget, I got bigger machines now and GPU pro processing, mm -hmm. so it speeds things up. But the point is, buying a dedicated camera tracker costs thousands of dollars. Okay. So I haven't done that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they uh, people are always whining I, about the uh, I am Duke uh, guy. The, the the foundry, <laughs> and so they're like, uh, good old Wes Anderson, you know, <laughs> uh -huh. of Anderson Technologies and Synthize. They're always right. like, oh, he's a cheaper. So if you're if if you find that you're like, I just need a you know, um, but I just find yeah, I'm I, I'm thinking to myself like, okay, um, is it really that necessary? Can New candle anamorphic. That was another thing I was thinking oh, yeah. about. Yeah, yeah it, it, it has. But like I said, they have these lens models, and if you stack an anamorphic on top of a prime, on top of a um, then you're in trouble. Macro, you have made such a complex light path that the the camera solve cannot deal, cannot fit it yeah. into the. Because they come up with a single simple equation for your lens. Well, let's take a look at Regis for uh, for Sard's reel. <clears throat> and uh, I'll keep the volume down, and we'll play it twice. So here we go. Oh. I said, here we go.
affects the academy. Would that be you, wouldn't it? Well, actually, yes. Actually, uh, Regis and I work together a lot. <laughs> oh, okay. So you know this guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we work together a lot. <laughs> In fact, this this is uh, one of the one of my shot kits that I uh, gave him. I think have I seen uh, have I seen this machine back here on no a, a no he PhD? built this specifically. It may be conceptually similar to something you've seen, but he built that uh, set for him and I are producing a bunch of shot kits together. Oh, okay. Uh, so. Now. Look, trying to comment on the demo reel, this is another one of the shot kits, this is a wire removal, okay? This is particularly vexing because you have the reflection in the glass, which has two layers of picture content. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he, Regis is, is a rather talented generalist. He can do 3D, he can do compositing, he can do Houdini, he can particle sims. Uh, so he's a very, very talented guy. He is also one of those people I was telling you about that there's no... No studios in his local vicinity. Mm, gotcha. Now, trying to comment on this reel, it is. I am looking at it at one tenth I, I, resolution. I, so I <laughs> obviously can't talk about edges and stuff like that. Okay, but um, one of the most important things: the, the shot breakdowns are very important. He does a pretty good job on the shot breakdowns. Okay, that's a really important part of your demo reel: is having good shot breakdowns. The guy looking at this reel wants to know, not, oh, I worked on this shot. He wants to know exactly what did you do. Maybe I just did the roto. Okay, you better say that. Okay. Um, so his, his uh, shot breakdowns are pretty darn good. He's got some interactive lighting going on behind the gal here. That looks nice. Um, and But I can't comment on his keys. Okay. But his color correction, again, I'm seeing a mm -hmm. tiny fractional resolution. Yeah, he gave me his this as an MPEG-4. It's not a video link I can't send you. Right, right. Um, so, uh, and, but his, his color correction is pretty darn good. Good balance of the uh, black points and white points. And um, get, getting the uh, hue and saturation well done. Uh, this one, the, the white uniform, uh, I think, needs a little more love in the color correction. Mm-hmm. Okay. But but uh, in general, uh see and these are this this is actually gonna be a shot kit that, that we're gonna be releasing on FX Academy, that very shot. Oh, okay. The idea is for the artist to buy the shot kit, composite it, and then add his own secret sauce. He has to do the keying. He does the, the lightsabers, he does the penetration effect. Yeah, and this this shot was very difficult because of the, uh, the, the glass reflection on the right-hand side. Oh, is there, is there so, a glass? Oh, this is a window. Okay. Well, no, no. Back it up a little bit and look on the right-hand side. See that glass door? Oh, okay, okay. I gotcha. Okay, looking at the, the left-hand image, the wire. you can see the wire reflecting in the door. Ouch. Okay. <laughs> Has a wire removal problem. Okay. That's, that's a problem. Uh, my only critique, and uh, who am I? Uh, but I would say maybe a little bit of shadow here under the the uh, uh, this this little area right here. Is it it always, it's all, yeah, shadow? it's always like when you have a flat surface and you render. It's always sometimes hard to read the shadows around this. I mean, there could be the occlusionary right. shadows, but um, sometimes I don't know if you do this, but I cheat it on the y direction on the on the shadow, bring it down just a hair. Just so you, you, you see you the would physical exaggerate thing. the contact shadow a yeah, little bit to make sure shadow. it reads well. Yeah, I mean that's that's a little cheating, but you know. Um, yeah. I, I'm looking at a 200 by 200. I I, <laughs> <laughs> I do know that this stuff is very difficult. All of this uh, despill color correction edge work, you know. Um, yeah. It's it's not a lot, especially when doing interactive lighting. It, that can get pretty pretty crazy here. I did feel like there was some tracking misalignment here on this 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 uh, thing right here. It felt there's a little bit of a shift or a drift right on his leg. Maybe this just a skating on that foot? Yeah, on that foot there. Um, but Perhaps again, something resolution, you're viewing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, in general, it's 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 a nice reel. I, like like you were saying, just a more explanation of what it is you did. And I, I do feel a little bit more of a less time on letting shots linger too long. You know what I mean? Um, yes. Yeah, you, your reel needs to be two, two and a half minutes. Yeah. Uh, 
the guys that are watching this, they're busy, okay, and they'll shut you off in 30 seconds if they don't see what they what they're looking for. But uh, here here's an important point about demo reels. If you're an entry level person, you're trying to break into the industry. What you don't need are a bunch of green screens and CGI shots. That's a compositor. That's an intermediate job. And you are trying to break in as a junior, as the, as the Indians call you, a fresher. Um, and you're showing work that is a level way above what I would hire you for. Mm -hmm. What you need is a demo reel that is spot on for the work I'm trying to be hired in for. So if I'm trying to enter the industry, I should be showing paint, roto, and cleanup. Hmm. Yeah, we've uh, we've discussed that with a lot of people. You know, it's interesting though. Um, there's been some people on here that are like giving us different viewpoints towards that. They'll say, "Yes, yeah, shoot for roto cleanup." You know, um, but at the same time, some of them go. Uh, most of them say what you're saying, but some of them are like, "Well, they're just hiring." compositing positions now and not these intro cleanup positions now so they need to be ready to go right off the bat so i'm like well you know depends on what studio how big the studio is the infrastructure if they have a whole roto and paints you know department you know um you know that, that i think that plays a part too you know now fair point um fair point uh I, I teach my students that in a small shop you'll have to wear many hats mm-hmm the larger the shop, the more subdivided the labor is. Uh, you get to a really big shop, they'll have a hair guy. All he does is hair, okay? <laughs> but in a smaller shop, you are expected to do the primary color grade, all the cleanup, all the roto, you know, everything for the shot, all the tracking yourself in a, in a small shop. But so that's that, also uh, more demanding on, you know, a junior person. A, a junior person... Stick to your knitting, okay? Stick to what you can you can uh, master with, within your skill set, paint, roto, and cleanup. Uh, you, they're not going to hire you into an intermediate position when you are uh, trying to enter the industry. Mm -hmm. I don't care how pretty your demo reel is. Don't forget, there's more to working on visual effects than, than simply keying a green screen. Mm -hmm. You know, there are pipeline issues, there's there's color management issues, there's all kinds of issues. Okay. In fact one of the one of the big complaints, uh, in fact that's why I was at Frame Store for Christ's sake. The I every time I go into town, I make an appointment with all the big studios in that town and I talk with the comp supers and the VFX supervisors and, and I'm asking them this question. What are the deficiencies of your new hires? Because I want to fill up that hole. I want to plug up that gap, right? That's my market right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God, I don't know this. They don't know that. They don't, they don't understand color theory. They don't understand, you know, because this, the, the, uh, the schools have taught them how to operate the software. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. And that's an important part. But there's three parts. There's three bodies of knowledge to do visual effects. One is knowing your tools. You got to know which knob to grab if you want to increase the game. Two is the art. You have to have an artistic eye. You have to have necessary artistic experience because this is, after all, no matter how technical the tools, this is an artistic endeavor. Three, technique. Technique means I have worked on visual effects so long that when I look at a shot, I know there's four different ways to solve this problem, but these other three ways have deficiencies, so I'm going to use method number two, because I know, before I even get into it, which technique will be the fastest and most efficient. So having technique, but that comes from experience, okay? Now, you can get vicarious experience um, in, in the... One of the big innovations in the last uh, version of my book, the fourth edition, that you've been talking about. I included the brand new content, workflows. Okay? What is the workflow for grain management? What is the workflow for lens manage, lens uh, distortion management? So I, I've included a number of uh, workflow issues 
think of this as vicarious production experience. That sounds awesome. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think, you know, to kind of close up this uh, session, uh, pretty much the gap that we see more than anything is getting young folks in whatever end of the world to be ready for production and when they're remotes even worse but even for education for vfx comps as you and i know they take a very long time to make we don't have 10 hours for you and i to record a video to show how to do it uh so we are i believe a lot of us that are at the forefront of just trying to just not just do shots but do shots shots that are at a level that can start to develop all of those skill sets that you talked about. And also, I believe a pioneer spirit is needed. There needs to be a pioneer sort of like, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to go, you know, a, a drive. I always, when I tell my students, I always take a, a chair on wheels. I always push it around. I say, you're going to be either two of diff two different type of students. You're either going to be the this chair where I'm dra I drag the chair along. I say, oh, you, you fell back. Oh, let me, let me help. Oh, oh you, you didn't come in. Oh, you didn't do your homework. Oh, oh. And I'm pulling the chair. Either I'm pulling you, or then I take the chair and push it away from me. And I say, or you're the chair that runs ahead of me. Mm -hmm. You know, And mm -hmm. that's always Better. been my advice to them. Like, are you going to be, there's, there are circumstances in life. You will have, you know, people that uh, pass away in your family, emergencies. This is life. But when you have 20 of those, I start to worry <laughs> in right. a small amount of time, you know. Right. And then the you got the lazy generation of today you got to deal with, too. So with that said, I think we are both, uh, all you know, everyone else out there uh, that's doing visual effects training, we're trying our best. And you, sir, are really at the forefront. And there's not, like I said, there's not anybody I've ever worked in VFX compositing that does not know who you are and is grateful gotcha. for everything that you've done for us and learning the VFX process because this is highly technical stuff. And we yep. need people who know how to teach. And that's a skill, knowing it and knowing how to teach it. So. Now, you just touched on a really important point. Uh, it's one thing to know how to do it. It's a completely separate skill to know how to teach it. Yep. Oof. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so with that said, I'm going to get some lunch. I thank you again, Steve, uh, and uh, also thank your wife for uh, kind of uh, getting this whole thing organized. And we're really appreciative uh -huh. of your time. Um, sure. Do you have anything to say before we close or...? Um, you know, comp on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. It was great talking to you. Thank you, sir.